Attorney Eric Gonzalez, who is one of seven candidates hoping to become Brooklyn's next district attorney. Um, thank so, you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. I really appreciate you. it. Thank you very much. So I am currently the, the acting DA in Brooklyn. I've been the acting DA since Ken Thompson passed away this past October. Ken Thompson came into the district attorney's office really with a mission of making sure that there was equitable justice in Brooklyn. As acting district attorney now, as DA hopefully if elected in the future, what would you see as your personal mission? You know, I came with Ken. I was in the office. I had been serving as a bureau chief of one of the trial divisions. And when Ken got elected, he reached out to me and he asked me to join his executive team. And so that you know, vision of what justice should look like for Brooklyn, which is really you know, fairness and equal justice for all, is a vision that I shared with Ken. And going forward, that is my vision for what Brooklyn needs. So, you know, Brooklyn needs to um, continue to do what we're doing in terms of crime reduction and, and public safety. But people in Brooklyn need to feel that their criminal justice system is fair and that they will uh, be taken seriously if they're a victim of a crime. And when they're accused of a crime, that the criminal justice system won't look to make an example out of them, will treat them differently, but treat them with fairness and respect. For many years, the DA's office, before Ken Thompson came into office under Charles Hines, was dogged by allegations of favoritism towards Jewish power brokers. Um, do you think that there was any validity to those claims? You know, I, I don't know um, the politics behind what motivated, you know, D.A. Charles Hines and his connections. What I do know is that the community um, is an active community and often is a community that needed to uh, be reached out to because for a long time, and, and you know, we'll jump right into, I think, one of the main issues that dog Charles Hines in his tenure was this issue of you know, allegations of sexual abuse in the uh, Jewish community, in the religious Jewish community. And I think that um, the community was uh, scapegoated in some ways because I think that the community was not unlike many other communities, that the issues of sexual abuse exist in all communities. And it was something that I think took place that, um, you know, it was unfair to the community because it gave the impression that the community um, had a problem that didn't exist in other places. I had done some um, work in special victims and sex crimes as a young ADA, and I can tell you that that issue of sexual abuse happens in all communities. I think that what happened in the Hasidim community and other parts of the religious uh, Jewish community was simply that um, when victims were uh, reluctant to testify and there was some and I think this is true I think there was some reluctance from the community because the community is so tight-knit that uh, it was treated as when the prosecution was not successful that the uh, that there was favoritism um, and I think that it's very important for all of us to say that we have to do better in getting witnesses to come forward but we also have to make sure that we are not um, putting you know, children and people who are reluctant to testify, that we, we would not want a criminal justice system that would force them to testify by arresting them or arresting their parents. And I've seen that um, happen in different parts of the country where victims have been forced to testify under the threat of arrest or actually get arrested. What about Charles Hines also had a policy of not naming people who were accused of sexual abuse in order to make sure that victims would not be intimidated. Was that something that you think is a course of action you would want to follow or maybe not the best way to go? No, that was completely, um, I was dumbfounded by the policy. That's, I mean, we want to treat every community the same, right? And we want to have fairness for every community. And um, to say that we would not uh, identify some people, but in other cases we would do that was wrong, wrongheaded. Um, and I think many people tried to advise the former DA not to um, do that policy, but when Ken Thompson and I took power, that was one of the first things that we ended. Let's get the other elephant in the room that no one likes to talk about out on the table. Uh, drug abuse. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the name Malky Weiss. Malky Weiss uh, died on June 24th. She lived in Bar Park. She was 20 years old, uh, heroin overdose. overdose. 
Um, the drug epidemic has skyrocketed in recent years. Um, and the Jewish community alone, since January, there have been 60 fatal drug overdoses in young people. What would your thoughts be on, in some way, maybe take kicking things up a notch on drug dealers to just somehow try to put an end to a plague that is just killing so many of our young people? Great question. Listen, the opioid epidemic in New York City has skyrocketed. Um, in Brooklyn, we've seen an increase. You know, we've been very successful in bringing down the homicide rate in Brooklyn. You know, when I was becoming a prosecutor in the 90s, Brooklyn had about 821 homicides. And last year, we had roughly 127 homicides in Brooklyn. This year, we're doing even better than last year, which was the second lowest number. But our opioid um, overdoses have um, increased. And last year, we had over 350 people who died um, from some sort of drug overdose in Brooklyn. And so we need to do much better. I think the answer um, to this question really is going to deal with trying to take some of the shame away from families whose children are using uh, opioids and heroin, including in the religious communities uh, because, and the immigrant communities, because there's a lot, it's, it's not just in the Jewish community, it's in a lot of immigrant communities. It's actually in a lot of fairly uh, well-to-do and middle-class families, but they're afraid to go um, call the police or get help. We're creating a program here in Brooklyn, which is trying to deal with that. I want to deal with this opioid epidemic as a health issue instead of using our criminal justice system. Because what we've done um, too often is we've arrested people for using heroin. And because we've done that, people have been reluctant to call the police or you know, get law enforcement involved. And then we try to backdoor them into treatment through uh, like places like drug court. The problem with drug court is that many people don't succeed. Um, heroin addiction and opioid addiction, um, we know the science tells us there will be relapses. And often these people wind up serving prison time um, because they couldn't complete the program. So I'd like to treat it as a health um, problem and this is what I'm, I plan to do. I plan to hire drug counselors in my office. Um, currently, the office has never had drug counselors, and when people call the police or the police get involved, um, and we go down to the precinct and we see a person who is not a seller but just a user and addicted to the drugs, we give them the option right then and there to come with the drug counselors and get them into rehab. And then we have to talk about how we're going to do rehab because we need to have culturally sensitive and competent places to do this rehab. Because if you have someone who's you know, um, religious and going to follow you know, kosher dietary laws and Sabbath, and, then we have to have a rehab facility that can deal with their religious concerns. And it's just not in the Jewish community, it could be in the Muslim community, it could be in all kinds of communities. We have to make sure that we have the resources in our community so that people will actually seek treatment. I should not be using the hammer of sending you to prison because you're addicted to drugs um, to get you to get treatment because we've seen that before. What happens is people wind up going to prison. And the real movement now is to free up our tax dollars and free up our, and our prisons from people who are nonviolent people who are addicted to drugs. So I'm hoping that when we start this program, we can uh, really treat the supply of it. Um, we'll, we'll go after the major distributors. We've done that. We've actually done two of the largest heroin cases in Brooklyn history. Uh, but then we have to deal with the demand. And I think that you would, people would be more likely to uh, seek help uh, if they didn't think they were going to be in tr criminal trouble. And I'll say one last thing about this. In many of the homicides that happen, those people overdose, when the police get up there to the house, the family's already cleaned out the you know, hypodermic needles, they've cleaned out the heroin, um, because they think that everyone's gonna get in trouble. And so what we need to make sure is that people also understand that if you call the police, if you assist someone who's in distress um, from heroin abuse, that the law will, we won't prosecute you. We'll never prosecute someone who's trying to help a person. Um, and, and too often when two people are using heroin together, one may be overdosing, the other person is in a position to help, 
but feels afraid to call the police because they're afraid that they're going to get arrested. And so again, health treatment is what we need, and we'll do enforcement on you know the big distributors who are bringing the, this you know scourge into our communities. Some of your opponents in the upcoming election have commented. You have a wonderful statistic. I understand now twenty three overturned convictions. Mm -hmm. Um, since Ken Thompson came into office, some of your opponents have said, well, you were part of working in the DA's office with Charles Hines and have said, well, maybe you have a part in those wrongful convictions. What would you say to those claims? Oh, the nonsense. <laughs> um, quite frankly, the nonsense. Most of these convictions are 20 and 30 years old. Um, they were before I was even in the office. The big, the big uh, factor is I was not one of Charles Hines' top executives. I was a young assistant handling special victims cases, trying cases, um, eventually became a bureau chief in the office. And the real claim is Ken Thompson picked me to start this unit for him, to start the conviction review unit. All 23 cases that have been vacated have been done um, with me being actively involved in organizing, looking at the cases, making recommendations to him, and ultimately making these recommendations on myself. We've really cleaned up this office. Um, I've done more to uh, prevent wrongful convictions and to um, free people who've been unjustly jailed than all the um, other candidates together. Are there any final thoughts you'd like to share with our viewers and our readers about what makes you the best choice to be the Kings County DA? Well, I think I just kind of clued in on that. I've been doing the work now as the district attorney of Brooklyn for some time. You know, you have to look at what the DA's office was like in 2012, 2013. All the criticisms of how the office operated in a political way and the issues that we were having in our city. And you look at where this DA's office is now and all the good work. You know, Ken Thompson was battling cancer. I helped him run the office. When he passed, I continued to do the work as the DA. I am so proud of the office and what we've accomplished. We've really uh, managed to keep Brooklyn safe. And I think that the average person in Brooklyn um, believes that we're in a much better place with our criminal justice system in Brooklyn today than we were a few years ago. And I've been a big part of that. Terrific. Thank, thank you, you so much for your time. Nice and to meet lots you. of luck on the primary. We hope to hear great things coming out of this office. All right. Thank you.